Great. Well, good good afternoon, everyone. Um, and if we can have the screen shared, please. Um, on behalf of Baker McKenzie, thank you very much for joining us for today's Innovate Finance uh, webinar, where we're going to be discussing key regulatory developments for fintechs to be aware of and watch out for in 2021. I'd like to start by introducing my speakers for today's session. My name's Mark Simpson. I'm a partner in Baker McKenzie's London office, where I specialise in advising fintechs and other financial services firms on FCA regulations, and where I also co-chair our fintech practice. I'm joined by three of my colleagues today, Julian Hui, senior associate in our fintech group, who has a particular focus on the payment services space and on work involving new technologies like crypto assets. Guy Stevenson, senior associate in the group, who focuses in particular on consumer regulations, and Sarah Williams, associate in the group, who advises fintech clients across the payment, securities and investment sectors. Before starting in earnest, I'd like to thank Innovate Finance for inviting us to speak today and for all of their help in setting up the session. And a few quick housekeeping points. We invite you all to submit questions throughout the session. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll address questions at the end of the presentation and we'll do our best to get to all of them. If we can't get to your question, please get in touch with any of us after the webinar. The session is being recorded, so if you need to step out at any point, you should be available to you to watch again on the Innovate Finance website. We've also prepared a brochure covering the topics we're going to discuss today and more, which will be circulated to you. A quick legal disclaimer, as most of you are, we're all presenting from our homes. So while we try to create a studio-like atmosphere, please forgive the occasional dog bark, stray child or doorbell. And finally, as regulatory specialists, you'd expect us to have a business continuity plan in place in the event that one of us becomes incapacitated or loses our internet connection. Fingers crossed we don't need to test whether this works. So if we can move on to uh, slide number three, please. Uh, so the next slide, yeah, thank you. Um, so before moving to today's specific agenda, I wanted to make some preliminary comments on the current climate and backdrop to the changes we expect to see over the coming year. I'm sure you'll agree with us that whilst there's never a dull moment in the world of FinTech regulation, right now feels like a particularly critical time for the industry. It feels like we're at a crossroads for a whole host of reasons, and over the next few years, we're going to see things change substantially here in the UK and elsewhere. The extraordinary success of our sector in recent years means there is more focus on it than ever before. We know the government is very engaged in a supportive way, but we also know regulators are engaged as they try to assess the rapid pace of growth and understand whether the current framework is fit for purpose. We see a few specific drivers of change, which are here on the slide. Firstly, Brexit. We know the government is redoubling its efforts to ensure the UK fintech sector can carry on being competitive. The UK has established its leading position partly through its innovative and friendly regime whilst an EU member. With Brexit and the loss of firms' ability to use the UK as a base to passport their licence around the EU, the UK has lost one of its earlier advantages. But we may be able to offset some of these losses through changing our framework. That doesn't necessarily mean repealing all EU law in this space, which the UK helped to shape probably more a case of looking how to, we can regulate more smartly and more quickly in future. The government has a number of specific initiatives we're going to come on to discuss, ranging from a root and branch review of its approach to looking at the UK's payments architecture and a new regime for crypto assets. Also, recent rule changes have had consequences that need to be assessed. You don't need us to tell you that in recent times, waves of new rules like open banking and PSD2 have created a framework for new players to access consumers' financial data and use this to provide innovative services. With this, we are seeing regulators move away from their traditional focus on those who hold customer funds or assets or give investment advice towards those who handle customer data, a trend we think will continue. Also, the speed of technological change and market evolution is outpacing our lawmakers and regulators. The core regulations that set the framework in this area are in large part very modern, developed largely since the 2008 crisis, and with some, like PSD2 and MIFID2, only a couple of years old. The fact that these frameworks already need a refresh shows how quickly things are moving. At the same time, the sector is taking market share and becoming more systemically important. The number of customers using digital channels has been growing, with recent research showing around 20% of consumers now use a fintech brand. With this growth is coming more regulatory scrutiny. Some fintechs have quickly evolved into integral players. In a COVID environment, it's natural for regulators to start worrying about failure of these firms and whether some may be in danger of becoming too big or too complex to fail. Wirecard is a case in point, a high profile example of a firm whose interconnectedness to other fintechs and their consumer customers meant that its disorderly failure would have created significant customer detriment and a potential domino effect. Also, we see an increasing reliance on technology by traditional financial institutions continuing to grow. 
we see firms increasingly looking to outsource functions to cloud service companies and other external providers. Internal processes like client onboarding and monitoring are increasingly becoming digitalized and more reliant than ever on unregulated providers. Of course, this is great for the fintech sector and provides significant opportunities for you all. But such as the reliance on some of these providers, it's little wonder regulators are starting to think about whether some of them may become too important to fail. Where regulators used to worry about bank failures, they now worry equally about cyber attacks or loss of data. These are questions regulators have been looking at for a couple of years now under the heading of operational resilience. But with the COVID crisis having shaken things up further, the full long-term effects of the pandemic have yet to become apparent, but consumers are likely to have moved even more towards digital engagement as bank branches have been closed and people's ability to travel has been limited. Similarly, an increase in remote working has led to an uptick in reliance on technology. COVID also forms a wider backdrop, as we'll discuss later. The current situation with the economy has only enhanced regulatory scrutiny on things like treating customers fairly, particularly where they're in difficulties. We are going to see this continue in a focus in particular on how vulnerable customers are being treated, with such customers deferring spending, increasingly using buy now, pay later and other products. If we can move to the agenda slide, please. So we're going to discuss, group our topics today into a few themes as we've shown here on the slide. First of all, I will give a general update on the UK's proposals for its post-Brexit regime for fintech. Next, I'll ask Sarah to talk about a number of related themes under the heading of tech, innovation and data, including operational resilience and outsourcing, as well as developments in the payment space. We will then turn to Julian to talk about crypto regulations. For many years, people have complained about the lack of a bespoke regime for the sector. Now, a bit like buses, two have come along at once with the EU's micro-regulation and, hotter off the press, the new UK Treasury proposal from a couple of weeks ago. This could be one of those cases where it's be careful what you wished for. We'll then move on to Guy, who will talk about some of the consumer protection themes I mentioned before. Finally, we'll spend a few minutes talking about latest trends in financial crime before we address any questions. So if we can move to the next slide, please, and onto the timeline on the next slide. So moving to this timeline, we can see a significant number of UK policy developments that are being proposed in the context of the news regime post Brexit. So we won't discuss all of these in detail, but the timeline I think illustrates the number that are taking place. And over the last few years since the referendum, the media has tended to focus on how the UK would position itself to get equivalence from the EU, indicating the UK would have to remain in lockstep with EU rules, thereby defeating the rationale for Brexit in the first place. But what we've seen, particularly since Boris Johnson's administration came into office, has been a focus instead on the UK using its Brexit system to do things differently. The, U the government and the regulators seem to be uh, on the same page about this. So last week we heard Andrew Bailey telling Parliament that the UK should not accept becoming a rule taker as the price for equivalence. In the meantime, the EU has not granted equivalence in any case, which means that some business has inevitably migrated to the EU since the 1st of January. Already, it's going to be more difficult to bring that business back, and so the logic for divergence increases. With Brexit, the government's short-term approach has been to provide as much continuity as possible for firms by onshoring the EU framework into UK law, granting equivalence to the EU in a range of areas, and working with regulators on temporary transitional arrangements to facilitate continued trading on EU exchanges, for example, and grandfathering for EU firms doing business in the UK. This is positive in the short term, but does mean that the UK's laws today look identical to those we had before. There is a consensus that will change. So the government has already said that the onshore EU legislation will not be optimal in the long run, and the regulators will be given powers to replace, amend and consolidate it into their own rule books. You can see there on the timeline a number of specific developments. So firstly, looking at the structure of regulation, there's a financial services bill currently going through Parliament, which is one of the biggest pieces of legislation in this space for some time. When it becomes law, the bill will set a high level framework, which may include new activity based principles that the regulators are required by law to take into account when regulating specific activities. So, for example, you could see a specific framework to deal with payment services regulation with specific objectives to the sector, for example, requiring the promotion of innovation. You might see a different set of objectives for insurance and insure tech. Regulators will be given very wide powers to then make rules that put the flesh on the bones of this regime. Baked into this would be a framework around consultation with Treasury so that its role in non-urgent rulemaking can be formalised with robust levels of parliamentary scrutiny. One of the benefits of this should be to create as few rule books as possible. The EU system has led to lots of different pieces of law, technical standards and the like. The UK will want to consolidate this so there is a single source as far as possible. 
There are also some welcome proposals to require the regulators to consider the importance of accessible rule books that take advantages of innovation to reduce compliance burdens on firms, such as machine readable rules. This has the potential to make firms' lives easier from a compliance standpoint and facilitate the development of RegTech. Although the FS Bill has a lot of important provisions in it, there remains a lot to be done to determine what specific initiatives will be taken. So you can see there on the slide, a call for evidence has been done from the Treasury Committee and uh, equally importantly, the government's future regulatory framework review, the current phase of which is due to a uh, close for consultation on the 19th of February. If we can move on to the key takeaway slide, please. So on the substance of regulation, we expect we'll see a significant degree of divergence over time and will probably evolve towards a less prescriptive and rules based regime towards a more principles based regime tailored towards UK market structure and the competitiveness of the city. We expect to see the UK move as I say, towards a less prescriptive regime, potentially with some exceptions. On the whole, the FCA is likely to be looking to do things at a high level. So last year, they started to use a phrase, outcomes focused regulation. This means that you look at what outcomes you want customers and markets to experience from firms, and then require them to ensure those outcomes are achieved, but giving them some flexibility as to how they get there. There was a real uh, consensus amongst regulators that the current framework uh, derived from the EU may not achieve benefits proportionate to costs and burdens. The FCA has gone on record, for example, as saying that disclosure has been a go-to tool for regulators for too long and is not working. They've done behavioural research, which indicates that despite all of the new disclosures customers get, the customer's behaviour does not really change very much. So you can tell customers about costs and charges, inducements you pay or receive, or poor product performance, and they will often just proceed and buy the product anyway. So the EU has not always got this balance right. Part of the idea behind the outcomes focused regulation concept is that you're perhaps more flexible about how you allow business that is more vanilla to be carried on, but you couple this with a more interventionist approach in areas that you don't like. We're already seeing the UK look at some specific areas of divergence. So before Christmas, Sam Woods at the PRA announced that he intends to use our departure from the EU as a trigger to revisit the prudential regime for banks. This could see the introduction of a more graduated regime whereby simpler banks do not have to comply with the full weight of the Basel driven standards, but face a simpler set of rules that converge towards Basel as they get larger. A similar approach could be applied in his view to liquidity requirements. And we've already seen the UK using uh, its freedom by, for example, uh, not choosing not to take forward the CRD5 rules on intermediate bank holding companies, as well as deferring entry into force of benchmarks legislation and other areas. Finally, a quick point on style. We expect the UK to take a more uh, bottom-up approach in terms of style than the EU has been doing. Traditionally, the UK viewed industry codes written by the industry for the industry as an important regulatory tool. And we have seen some encouraging developments that they plan to bring some of these back. Secondly, looking at the perimeter, I won't talk about this at length as we'll be mentioning it later, but we are seeing a more general trend around revisiting the perimeter. The FISMA legislation is now 20 years old. Areas we're seeing talked about here include crypto assets, but also other areas, for example, around firms who approve financial promotions on behalf of third parties. We're also seeing the FCA wondering whether it should be given direct supervisory powers over technology platforms that publish financial promotions. Also, there's a review going on of the unsecured credit market, which we'll discuss later. Specifically on the fintech sector, the, we're going to uh, see developments in the area of uh, green finance and also more broadly, the Khalifa review, which I'll come on to mention. So looking at green finance, the government is really going to push this with its strategy published last year, looking at how to green finance, as they say, by ensuring financial risks and opportunities from climate and fa environmental factors are integrated into mainstream decision making. Financing green, thereby accelerating finance to support delivery of the UK's carbon targets and clean growth and capturing opportunity by ensuring UK financial services firms can capture the domestic and international opportunities arising from the greening of finance, such as climate data and analytics and from financing green, such as new green financial products and services. Rishi Sunak has committed the UK to being the first country to make the task force on climate disclosures aligned uh, mandatory by 2025, and the UK will also implement its own green taxonomy. Last but not least, look out in the coming weeks for the report from the FinTech Strategic Review being led for the government by Ron Khalifa OBE, which is looking to ensure how to maintain the UK's global reputation in FinTech and ensure it has the resources to succeed and thrive. I know many of you have been asked to contribute to this review. We know from the terms of reference, it's going to be broad ranging, looking at everything from the investment landscape to how to create and better connect regional fintech hubs, as well as how to better facilitate cross-border cooperation to support UK fintechs exporting. So expect to see the government push this as well in their future trade agreements internationally.
So with that, I'm going to hand over now to Sarah to discuss tech innovation and data. Thanks, can I get the next slide, next slide please? Uh, actually, I just keep, keep going, I think two more. That would be great, thank you. Um, so yeah, in 2021, as we've heard, we're gonna really see the regulators continue to grapple with finding balance between fostering innovation and competition, but also trying to ensure that customers and markets are protected against the risks of the increased um, use of technology. So I think the first thing to mention is, you know, th this twin focus of innovation and risk mitigation clearly comes through in the EU's digital finance strategy. Uh, the consultations were launched in September last year and they propose you know, the introduction of strict and harmonized rules on digital operational resilience and new regulatory framework governing crypto assets. But at the same time, they're promoting open finance data sharing, um, enabling EU wide digital identities in finance. So quite different aims being seen ac across the strategy. So come talking about the digital operational resilience framework or DORA, as it's being called, you know, this really mirrors a lot of the work that's already been undertaken on outsourcing and, um, you know, under the EBA guidelines. So, for example, they're proposing an introduction of due diligence measures, monitoring, contractual requirements, and really, you know, managing the life cycle of these IT service providers from onboarding to ongoing relationship management and stress testing of relationships. The big change is really the move to bring critical IT uh, third party providers in under the supervision, um, which will be one of the biggest changes cloud computing service providers and other critical IT providers to financial services firms will find themselves subject to EU oversight and at risk of fines, which have been proposed as something um, pretty substantial fines for non-compliance, which would be a big shift for the, these types of players. And this really represents the growing concern, as we've been hearing about already today, over the importance that these providers have to the industry and the risk their failure poses to consumers um, and the market. So despite Brexit, similar themes are also being seen in the UK. So in 2021, we're also expecting to see further development of the FCA and PRA operational resilience measures. Uh, the delayed consultation closed in October 2020. Uh, current plans are that firms won't be required to meet any new requirements before the end of 2021, but we will have a view on what will be implemented, um, which you know will, will give firms time to prepare for 2022. The FCA has, however, made clear that operational resilience is already a focus and that, you know, despite, despite the delayed consultation, uh, there is an expectation um, that all firms already have contingency plans to deal with major events and that those plans have been tested. And, you know, the FCA has confirmed that it's actively evaluating contingency plans, a wide range of firms alongside the PRA. And we're aware of this work being undertaken, particularly in the payments sector, where the SCA is, ask, is asking firms to confirm, you know, what steps they've taken to prepare for sort of major events. One point to note on the UK framework is that it's, it's not currently clear whether the UK approach will also extend to oversight of third party providers. But that is something that was previously raised in Treasury discussions on resilience and, and tech. So something to look out for as um, the framework continues to develop in the UK. Staying on resilience for a moment, but more towards financial resilience. Uh, Mark's already mentioned, you know, the concerns around Wirecard and the, the too big to fail payment providers. One aspect of this um, is that we've seen the introduction of a payments special administration regime to help manage payment and e-money firm insolvencies uh, and particularly manage the return of customer funds. This has also been alongside, you know, a renewed focus on safeguarding measures and, and how are payments firms and e-money firms who can have a huge impact on, on consumers and, and the financial system, but don't answer it to the same uh, level of supervision of banks. You know, how can we make sure that they're protecting customers' money? So again, you know, we see in these developments, the real desire to ensure management of risk to consumers whilst balancing it against a proportionate um, application of the rules. So looking then uh, at what else we're looking at in the UK, we're also expecting feedback on the open finance call for input and a reboot of the push to enable digital IDs in the UK. As many of you will know, previous attempts to roll out a UK digital identity has not seen great success in the UK. And uh, COVID I think has really driven, need, driven home the need to have a digital ID solution, not just for financial services, but just more generally, it's something people have found that they need to do if you can't take your passport down to the bank or whoever needs to check it. All of these proposals are at a very early stage, so yet to be seen to what extent they mirror or diverge from the EU level discussions on the same topics. I think one thing that will be important to monitor 
is the extent to which any divergence leads to increased regulatory burden where firms are being asked to comply with multiple similar but different sets of rules on the same topic. On to the innovation side, uh, the proposed regulatory approach to the new payments architecture, or the NPA, uh, was published in Q4 last year. The NPA will replace FACs and faster payments with a more innovative um, and competitive interbank payment environment with the opportunity for greater utilisation being intended. So the initial publication of the schemas and implementation guide for retail banking payments are expected in the second half of this year. Uh, so we're going to see those proposals, proposals develop further. The EU payments, uh, retail payment strategy is all, also promoting similar aims at an EU level. Uh, there's a real push towards more competitive and innovative payments markets, better payments infrastructure, and the promotion of cross-border and international solutions. So this includes um, the rollout of instant payments. So they're looking to have full rollout and full uptake of instant payments by the end of 2021 and ensuring direct access by non-bank players to all payment systems. And they have made clear that, you know, there will be changes to legislation if necessary to promote these aims. So looking then at big data, AI and machine learning, again, another PRA and FCA focus, there's a continued engagement with the industry on how do you enable these te technologies in a way that is safe, financially sound and ethical. Uh, you know, in this regard, the FCA is focusing in 2021 on delivering fair value in a digital age. Uh, they want consumers to benefit from digital innovation and competition, but they also want to ensure that consumers have confidence that they're getting fair access, uh, price, quality. And, you know, the FCA is going to look again at how they consider fairness in price discrimination. So building on the 27, uh, 2017 work that they did in this area, looking at, you know, unethical use of data how that creates unfair pricing or algorithmic bias and ensuring protection for vulnerable customers, which I think we'll talk about more later today. Um, also, I guess, important to note that um, the European supervisory authorities are looking at the same thing. So in 2021, they're going to publish their fintech and digitalization assessment, which looks at consumer protection concerns and benefits associated with AI and machine learning. Um, so again, you know, very similar themes coming out of the UK and, and the EU on all of these topics. Finally, I think it's worth noting that against the backdrop of innovation technology, the FCA has also stressed the risks of financial exclusion, particularly for those people who are, you know, digitally disenfranchised, who might lose out as more firms move to digital focus models. Um, you know, so I think as well as operational security risks of technology and innovation, these vulnerable customer impacts and, and how to address that are also going to be a theme in 2021. Uh, next slide, please. So to come on to the, the, the key takeaways, um, so the first one, you know, operational resilience is still a focus, third party providers coming under EU supervision, possibly the same in the UK, which is going to have a big impact for the industry. Um, secondly, we know that there are um, changes coming to payment infrastructure, which may have, you know, quite a wide ranging impact, particularly the EU proposal proposals around access to payment systems. And then finally, you know, the ethical and safe use of big data, AI, machine learning, a focus in, in the UK and, and the EU. So looking at financial soundness, um, customer out, outcomes, and, and how, do you, how do you best use these technologies to progress the financial services industry without damaging consumers or, or the market? Um, so I think that, that's it on innovation, data and technology. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I think we'll move on to crypto now. If we move on to the next slide and we'll go one more along as well. Um, now, look, th there's an old joke about fighter pilots and it's how do you tell when a fighter pilot has entered the room? They'll tell you. And it's the same thing with people who have recently invested in crypto. Um, as the share prices and the prices, or sorry, the price of various crypto assets have gone through the roof, um, there are a lot of very happy investors, I guess. But while these huge price increases have actually been very great, well, been great for investors, regulators are more conscious of what comes next. And they are worried about the losses that could be sustained with the volatility, which is demonstrated by such price movements. Increasingly, therefore, lawmakers and regulators have sought to limit the potential consumer and market detriment that may arise from investments in crypto assets. They are aware, though, of the need to remain competitive and to avoid stifling innovation. And to this end, Many are currently engaging in comprehensive uh, consultation and discussion processes to ensure that the incoming uh, regulatory framework balances the risks faced by consumers with the competitive and innovative benefits offered by crypto assets. To that end, uh, over, on the con over on the continent, a phrase which has been imbued with new meaning since 11pm on 31 December, 
uh, MICA was published for consultation in September last year with the consultation period recently closing. The Markets in Crypto Assets Regulation is a regulatory framework which will establish a licensing regime, including disclosure, governance, conduct, and prudential rules for licensed entities for the crypto asset world. It also contains market integrity rules regarding insider dealing and market abuse to help build faith in crypto markets. It's perhaps one of the more comprehensive regulatory regimes for crypto assets which has been released to date. MICA has adopted a broad definition of crypto assets, which is in line with the definition in 51D, and that being a digital representation of valuable rights, which may be transferred and stored electronically using distributed ledger technology or similar technology. It will cover a broad range of services, such as custody and administration, operating crypto, trading platforms or exchanges, issuing crypto assets, advice on crypto assets, and reception and transmission of crypto orders. Um, interestingly, MICA does not currently contain an equivalence provision, and so it's not clear that any attempt by UK regulatory authorities in the post-Brexit landscape to align the UK regime with the EU regime would provide benefits to UK-based firms. However, the Commission will be mandated to prepare a report within three years of MICA coming into effect, and that is expected to cover whether or not an equivalence regime should be implemented. This consultation process is quite a long consultation process, and it's not really expected that MICA will be enforced before, say, 2024. Um, nevertheless, it does contain a detailed legal framework for crypto assets, which could provide a model for use for other nations going forward. In the UK, the UK has adopted, I believe, uh, Otto von Bismarck once said, fools learn from experience, but I learn from the experience of others. The UK has sort of taken that to heart and H HMT appears ready to adopt a relatively cautious approach in this regard. Um, Following from the Crypto Assets Task Force report in 2018, HMT recently consulted on the final two areas of regulatory engagement, which was identified in that report. Um, that being the consultation on financial promotions relating to crypto assets and the consultation on the regulatory perimeter relating to crypto assets. Um, on the consultation on financial promotions, uh, this was published in July 2020 with the consultation closing in October of last year. As an initial response, while HMT and the regulators consider the broader regulatory framework, the Crypto Asset Task Force had identified that it was appropriate to limit or regulate the promotion of crypto assets to investors um, so as to increase consumer protection, market integrity, and reduce the risk of crypto assets being used for financial crime. Uh, in order to bring these assets in scope, HMT proposes to amend the FISMA FPO to include crypto assets as controlled investment, meaning that they would be subject to the financial promotion prohibition in Article 21 of FISMA. They've also suggested that similar exemptions or exclusions as currently exist under uh, the FPO would, would exist for crypto assets. Um, moving then on to the consultation on crypto assets, which was published earlier this month. Um, the current proposals sought feedback most urgently on extending the regulatory perimeter to stable coins. And the reason for the focus on stable coins is that HM Treasury sees stable coins as having the greatest potential for use in the retail and wholesale markets. While some exchange tokens such as Bitcoin have traditionally been more popular with investors, the risks associated with these coins when these sorts of investments seem to be generally well understood and they generally remain only a small segment of the investments market. By contrast, stable coins have grown substantially in recent years with transactions in stable coins recently eclipsing those in Bitcoin. The new regulatory framework is likely to apply to crypto exchanges and custodian wallets as noted in the um, in, well, as the AML rules already apply to, but we'll also focus on issuers and other or system operators and other participants within the crypto ecosystem. Interestingly, it appears that HMT uh, has also considered the potential difficulties in determining the territorial scope for these rules, given that they are by their nature online and, and cross-border. On this basis, it's suggested that the firms which actively target the UK market will be required to have a UK presence and to be licensed in the UK. This marketing approach to territoriality is similar to that adopted by some EU countries with regard to payments, but would diverge from the existing UK territorial required requirements for payments and investment business, which instead focus on where the relevant business is carried out. Uh, on a final note, the consultation is also considering the extent to which the PSR and Bank of England as regulated of payment systems may also have a role, and it is likely that where a stablecoin infrastructure becomes a significant payment network, this could be subject to BOE uh, supervision. We expect this consultation period to continue throughout 2021 with consultation responses due by March of this year. Um, the focus will initially be on stable coins followed by a consultation on security tokens. The HMT consultations will also be followed by regul regulatory consultations setting out the detail of the relevant regulatory rules to be put into place. Um, so that's what's generally happening in sort of the regulatory perimeter world. 
but it's also interesting to look at what other developments are occurring in regard to the crypto world. And I think the other big area of development recently has been the interest in central bank digital currencies. Um, in March 2020, the Bank of England issued a discussion paper on the design opportunities and challenges for a central bank issued digital currency. And in effect, these CBDCs, as they're called, would be akin to a digital bank note issued by the BOE. Now, while that's quite a simplistic definition, it could actually represent quite a major change for the monetary and banking world. At present, funds are currently held in the form of either bank notes, or in, which are issued by the BOA, or held in accounts with banks, and those banks then themselves hold reserves with the Bank of England's uh, real-time gross settlement system. These digital bank notes would allow electronic currency to be issued directly through a BOA platform with access granted by payment interface providers. In addition, though, to the monetary and financial concerns, which uh, are being investigated by the, the central banks. There are also political considerations that need to be taken into account here. For example, privacy experts have raised concerns about the extent to which central governments would then be able to view and, and sort of see, oversee private citizens' individual payment transactions. This is all at quite an early stage and the Bank of England has not determined whether to proceed yet. It has noted that given the huge significance of the UK monetary and financial system, any decision to proceed will involve HMG and Parliament more broadly. It's therefore not expected that any CBDC will be issued by the Bank of England in the short to medium term and definitely not within 2021, although expect some developments in thinking in this area. Um, these CBDCs are also not unique to the UK. The ECB currently is consulting on whether to issue a digital euro and has noted that it's expecting to announce by mid-2021 whether it will proceed with a plan to launch a digital euro. Um, now, the final area, I guess, where we're still seeing developments in relation to crypto assets is, of course, financial crime. This is the most developed area of law relating to crypto assets, as regulators and lawmakers identified at an early stage the potential opportunities that anonymity associated with crypto assets provided to criminal terrorist organizations. Accordingly, we've there, there already, therefore already seen a wealth of new laws and guidance in this area. Most recently, registration requirements for crypto asset service providers subject to 5MLD came into effect earlier this month. Um, and the JMLSG also issued guidance to those providers as to how they can comply with the AML rules. Um, the financial crime use cases of the crypto continue to develop and evolve and supervisory and cooperative bodies uh, continue to monitor how criminal or terrorist networks are using these crypto assets. Later this year, we can expect a, the outcome of the FATAS 12 month review of guidance on virtual assets and virtual asset service providers to cover the emerging financial crime risks associated with crypto assets. If we can just move to the next slide, slide please. Um, so in summary, despite all these recent developments, the regulation of crypto assets and blockchain networks remains a bit piecemeal. Um, in the UK, it's not entirely clear the extent to which the current regime or the regime that they're consulting on will extend to stuff like MAR obligations uh, for unregulated crypto assets. Meanwhile, there's also new developments. So for example, the growth of decentralized finance networks such as Compound or blockchain oracles, which seek to bring real world assets onto the blockchain. Um, it's not clear how they would fit into the existing legislative framework or the frameworks which are being consulted on. These new applications will need to be considered and the regulatory frameworks developed to address new, um, those new offerings. It's therefore clear that the pace of crypto regulation is unlikely to die down anytime soon. Over to you, Guy, I think. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, can we move on, uh, Anne, again? Fantastic. So uh, in 2021, um, consumer protection will, as always, be a key focus of the FCA. Um, the FCA made that crystal clear in its uh, business plan for 2020-21. And it's even more likely to be a focus of regulators uh, taking into account uh, last year's COVID-19 um, crisis and the impact that had on consumers of financial services across the UK and beyond. So before we go into maybe some of the individual things on the timeline, I think one observation to make is an increasing use by regulators of product intervention powers fairly early doors after um, identifying problems. So we were expecting the SEA to publish a consultation paper on banning exit fees charged by the in, uh, by investment platforms this year. That's now been abandoned, but as Julian uh, briefly mentions, the SEA is proceeding with its uh, ban on retail service uh, sales of investment products 
referencing crypto assets. So picking out a few things on this timeline, um, the first one is uh, the vulnerable customer guidance. Uh, last year, we saw a, a consultation on some draft guidance for the fair treatment of vulnerable customers. I mean, I don't think there was anything within the guidance which was particularly groundbreaking. What the guidance seeks to do is build upon, upon the kind of existing principles for business, including principle six, which requires um, firms to uh, play due regard to the interests of its customers uh, and kind of highlights the FCA's expectations on firms when dealing with vulnerable customers to address some of the problems it's identified in the market, for example, complex products, um, confusing communications, digital exclusion, which Sarah mentioned earlier, um, inconsistent approach to consumers who are experiencing financial problems, and um, firms that target products at um, vulnerable customers. The key thing to remember here is just how broadly the FCA de uh, defined the concept of a vulnerable customer. And their, their definition is so broad that they've said one, a half of the UK adult population will have at least one characteristic which makes them vulnerable. So most firms, will be dealing with vulnerable customers um, on a daily basis. Maybe they're students, maybe they're, uh, got, um, they're not particularly tech savvy, maybe they're self-employed. Um, so it's really important that all firms uh, pay regard to this guidance. Um, so what does the guidance do? Well, it basically it says that you've got to look at your target audience for your product and identify who within that target audience is likely to be vulnerable and um, assess the impact of those characteristics on those customers' needs and embed uh, the fair treatment of vulnerable customers within each firm's uh, culture. So we expect to see the FCA finalise this guidance later on this year. And um, it is something which the FCA, I think, will be very hot on from an enforcement perspective. So firms which have maybe got issues with treating customers vulnerable, uh, treating vulnerable customers fairly, will be, uh, will be in for some scrutiny from the regulator. So now moving on maybe to the insurance world. Um, in recent years, and in particular last year, there was uh, an increasing focus on general insurance insurers pricing policies. In particular, the FCA have recently looked at loyalty penalties. So these are penalties where effectively existing customers, renewing customers for home insurance or motor insurance are charged more than if they were a new customer. So the FCA introduced a uh, consultation paper last year, which made a number of proposals, including um, extending product governance rules um, to uh, general insurers. Um, but the key, key change is in ICOBS, which will require firms to, um, to offer the same uh, renewal price as they would give to a, a new customer. So you can't charge an existing customer any more than you would for a new customer. So the consultation is still open. It closes on the 25th of January, and we expect a policy statement uh, later this year, probably around June or July time. The next point is uh, the duty of care consultation. So you may recall uh, four or five years ago, the FCA started talking about the possibility of introducing an overarching duty of care um, they were open to how that would happen. Um, would it be statutory? Would it be rules-based? Would it be a duty of care? Would it be a fiduciary duty? And in 2018, they published a discussion paper which went through all the various options, the pros and cons. And in the same year, they published a feedback statement. And the long and the short, that short feedback was uh, the industry didn't want a statutory duty of care. It felt it would overlap with existing obligations. There wasn't necessarily a need for it. And they felt that uh, the courts weren't really the appropriate forum for these things to be addressed. It should be done 
through regulation and by the FCA instead. So then it went a bit quiet and we didn't hear anything last year because of COVID-19, but it's, it's back on the agenda for this year. And the FCA um, are going to consult at some point this year on how it could potentially amend its principles for business um, to address some of the issues uh, in respect to a duty of care. So that might involve uh, amending principle two to uh, incorporate a concept that firms need to avoid foreseeable harm. They also have mentioned um, the idea that they might consider making uh, breaches of principles a, a actionable offence by an actionable right by a consumer. So a consumer could sue a financial services firm if they breach a principle and that caused them harm. That's not currently the case under FISMA. Uh, I, I suspect they will move away from that and they won't, uh, they won't go as far as giving a private right of action, but it is something they are considering. So uh, watch this space. So then the final point I want to uh, talk about on this timeline is the review of the unsecured credit market. So at the moment, um, there is a review being carried out um, into um, potential future regulation in the unsecured credit market by the FCA. They, ex they expect to report back um, anytime, anytime now in Q1. And this involves um, firms which might be relying on exemptions, maybe the exemption on 60F, uh, which allows you to be unregulated if you have interest-free credit for 12 months. We think of the kind of um, point-of-sale credit um, a lot of people are starting to use. And there's a couple of issues with this. One, people's reliance on it and potential mis-selling. And another thing is the lack of data that firms get about how leveraged individual customers are because there's no obligation on these market players to report default. So when you're applying for a loan, the lender will not have an idea of how leveraged you are in respect to unregulated credit. So there is a potential that players in this market, which are not currently regulated, will, uh, will become subject to maybe light touch regulation, but regulation Nevertheless, so uh, that's a, a kind of an important thing on the horizon. So maybe we can go to the next slide, just very conscious of time, which we're running out of. So the key takeaways. So as I, as I was mentioning, the general insurance market is under a lot of scrutiny at the moment, including on how it's been treating vulnerable customers through the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis. So we can expect to continue to focus on general insurance. How are they using data? Uh, how are they using big tech, you know, big tech. Um, so more focus on general insurance. The duty of care, everybody in the industry needs to be alert to this. Um, firms big and small need to be, I think, ready to respond to this consultation and explain to the FCA exactly what would be helpful, what would not be helpful. So that's relevant to everybody in the market. And number three is just this point that there is going to be so much focus on how firms are treating customers, in particular vulnerable customers, in light of the COVID-19 crisis. And I would place a substantial bet that we will see enforcement action in the next year or two on firms which have uh, fallen below the firms of uh, the FCA's uh, expectations on this. So I will hand, I think, to Mark to talk about financial crime. Thank you very much, Guy. So if we can move, please, to the timeline slide thanks very much so um <clears throat> i think it feels like we've been stuck in a sort of endless cycle of reform in this area over the last few years with you know four mld then five mld now six mld um and i guess the the main headline is that we don't see any let up in the pressure on this um both in the uk and as i'll come on to mention in the eu as well um, we're going to see a number of reforms uh, targeted at uh, greater ability to collect data, harmonisation of rules, tougher penalties and enforcement. So firstly, um, at the EU level, we've seen member states recently being required to transpose 6MLD 
Um, this is probably not hugely interesting from a UK perspective, but is relevant, obviously, to those of you who've got operations within the EU. Um, and the key things that's going to do is to harmonise further the definitions of criminal money laundering offences, as well as lists of predicate offences and sanctions. Um, the UK had already opted out of this before Brexit, and, and indeed uh, there is not much in 6MLD that's not already reflective of the position here in the UK anyway, um, but nevertheless something to be aware of for those of you with operations within the EU. Um, from a UK perspective, we're currently partway through the period covered by our uh, economic crime plan, which runs from 2019 until 2022, um, and has come against the backdrop, obviously, of some continuing unwelcome publicity for the UK internationally, most recently with the FinCEN leaks, which put a number of uh, sensitive documents, including SARS, into the hands of journalists. Um, and there was uh, quite a bit of commentary in the media around the dominant or predominance of UK related SARS that were part of those leaks. Um, some of which related to things like facilitating terrorism, fraud and circumvention of uh, financial sanctions. So we've seen political pressure arising out of that. We've seen Mel Stride, the chair of the Treasury Select Committee, writing to the FCA and HMRC off the back of these leaks and asking them to um, essentially explain whether they consider there to be any, any issues. And, and whilst the FCA appears to be confident that most of these cases uh, in the leaks have been dealt with, it does go to show the ongoing pressure that the regulators continue to be under and, and that of course will will trickle down um, with, with sort of renewed supervisory vigour uh, and, and potentially enforcement on firms and I think quite a similar story really in the EU where the fallout from the Danske Bank uh, scandal I think continues to manifest itself in demands for new AML and CTF powers at EU level, which I'll mention a bit more in a moment. So just in terms of some of the themes that we're seeing here, one of these I think is around expansion in scope of firms subject to AML obligations. Um, Julian's already mentioned crypto assets. We know that by 10th of January, uh, these businesses were supposed to be crypto exchanges and custodian providers were meant to be uh, registered and put controls in place under 4MLD. Um, now, the FCA did provide some limited grandfathering at a late stage around that, um, but we'll continue over the next 12 to 18 months to see some, some further expansions of scope. So, for example, extending our regulations to overseas trustees in certain cases um, under the current financial services bill going through Parliament, as well as expanding uh, certain trust uh, registration service uh, scope firms to include a new range of trusts. And perhaps most interestingly, some new rules that will require compulsory ID verification for all directors of companies, general partners in partnerships and designated members of LLPs, as well as those with significant control and making filings on company's behalf at the company's registry. So this would have some pretty important consequences, for example, including that an appointment of a director of an English company would not have legal effect until their ID is verified. Um, and it's also interesting to see companies house looking to develop an online digital ID system to try to make this process as quick as possible. Um, taking the perimeter theme on a slightly different tack, the FCA is likely to expand the scope of its annual financial crime report as well as noted there on the timeline. So in Q1, we're expecting some new rules on this. Currently around two and a half thousand firms are subject to the obligation to submit these reports. And whether you have to or not depends on the type of firm you are. So some firms like banks are subject to the requirements irrespective. But for some other firms um, like EMIs and consumer credit firms, they only need to do it where they generate a certain uh, revenue over £5 million. Well, under these new proposals, you will see all FISMA authorised firms that hold client money come in scope, as well as all PIs with the exception of uh, PISPs and AISPs, as well as all EMIs come within scope and crypto firms. Um, so quite an important expansion of scope uh, there. And um, although the timing of implementation is uncertain, for new firms within scope, they'll need to make changes to internal controls to capture the data that needs to be reported, which will require them to maybe gather quite a lot of information about customers, compliance controls, money laundering typo typologies and uh, suspicious transactions. The second theme I pick out there is enhancing supervisory powers. So in both the UK and the EU, we see continued efforts to enhance these powers. Um, at EU level, uh, as I said, there continues to be a concern around uh, after Danske Bank and also that the EU's framework is being enforced weekly. So several member states have been late in implementing 4MLD and 5MLD, and the Commission is actually uh, taking infringement proceedings against the number of member states for failing to do that. Also, last summer, we saw the Commission announcing its action plan on AML and uh, terrorist financing. 
and we're expecting some legislative proposals on a new EU single rulebook in this area and potentially a new EU level AML supervisor, which could be the EBA or some other body, as well as new coordination and support powers for national FIUs. So this is potentially a very significant one to watch out for with another revamp, yet another revamp of the EU rules and potentially an EU level enforcer, which uh, we could expect to be quite aggressive. At UK level, the UK has got a deadline of March 2021 to respond to some weaknesses identified in its uh, most recent FATF mutual evaluation. Um, relating to strength of its reporting regime and supervision arrangements. So we're expecting to see FCA implement some enhancements in this area around its supervisory regime and engagement, um, which may feed down to firms, obviously. And looking a bit further ahead, there's going to be a more comprehensive review led by Treasury on the effectiveness and scope of the ML regs, um, and more generally the framework and impact of the current regs, as well as the effectiveness of enforcement actions brought under POCA. We don't expect that to conclude until 2022. Um, and again, there on the slide, we just mentioned briefly the Home Office is considering some further legislative changes to the Process of Crime Act, particularly around confiscation regime, as well as there being a broader uh, review by the Law Commission of corporate criminal liability, again, at some point during this year. Um, so I was just going to briefly mention market conduct as well, um, the other sort of aspect of financial crime, just to note that under the Financial Services Bill, there's going to be some increased penalties put in place for insider trading and market abuse. Um, and at EU level, the review of the market abuse regulation rumbles on, um, and it's still possible that its scope could be extended to include spot FX. So firms trading in the FX markets should be aware of that. And if we could just move, please, to the key takeaways slide. So yes, just to summarise, I mentioned the, the perimeter firms particularly should look out for the new financial crime return coming up. Um, we also, as I said, expect uh, enhanced supervisory powers, especially at EU level, and again, with COVID, uh, remember that regulators are going to be looking at the potential for the COVID environment to have contributed to misconduct, whether that's to do with supervision of employees working remotely or uh, chances of sort of greater uh, scope for fraud during the uh, current climate. So potentially some enforcement action around that. And I think that concludes what we were going to say um, as part of the presentation. And we have received a few questions uh, from the audience. So thank you very much for those. Um, I'm going to maybe first of all turn, we've got a few questions on digital identity. So I wonder whether I could group those. Um, so we've had regarding digital IDs, does this include IDs for corporates or is this consumer only? And also, do we see um, the UK's forward looking plans as helping to put in place a new digital ID uh, framework? So Sarah, could I maybe ask you to address those? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, on the first one, I think the current focus is really on consumer IDs. It's not really looking at um, digital identities for corporate customers, which I know would obviously be hugely helpful. It's much, it's very difficult to onboard corporates. But um, I guess one thing to note on that is that the EU's proposed framework is still slightly unclear. Um, so it may be that, you know, when we get some further information later this year with the EBA guidelines, that it might have the potential to extend to corporates. In terms of, you know, does it fit into the UK's forward plans and, and, and how is this being looked at? I mean, I think there is a real recognition of the importance of digital IDs. A lot of it has come out of COVID. They had, you know, uh, 2.6 million people apply for self-employment support and, uh, you know, 2 million of them didn't have digital identities and they found it very hard to be on, on board and, and open up the access to that scheme. So there is a recognition of its need. Um, the government has finally appointed a chief digital officer after an 18 month, month search. So th there is sort of drive within the government, but currently this strategy is pretty much based on a few six, six principles. There, there's nothing really concrete about what they're going to do. And it's gonna be very reliant, I think, on um, the private sector engagement. You know, everything you've seen where these have been successful in other countries have had huge, in, you know, it's been hugely important that banks have been involved in, in delivering those IDs. So I think it's yet to be seen how much um, they, 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 they really push basically to get this done. Um, so I think it's a want, but whether it actually happens, we'll, we'll see. Thank you, Sarah. So, so there's another question, which is, um, a slightly different topic. So around uh, digital financial inclusion, um, there being big opportunities in the developing world, including in the Commonwealth, 
um, many of which follow English law. So do we see any pro-market regulations to attract fintechs to set up in the UK and target the developing world? I think this is a really interesting question. And, um, you know, I, I do think the government is going to look very closely at um, the competitiveness of the UK sector internationally as part of all of these reviews. And one thing that I think this would feed into is how they cater for fintech uh, in new trade agreements that the UK may sign after Brexit with some of these countries. And we've seen them, you know, trying to already with the EU agreement and with the recent rollover of the Japan agreement, trying to break down some of the barriers um, that exist there for digital firms generally. So, for example, restricting uh, data localization and the like. Um, and more generally, we know the FCA is sort of very keen through its role chairing the, the GFIN, which is the Global Financial Innovation Network of, of uh, national financial services regulators, to try to work collectively with uh, other financial regulators globally to, um, you know, ease the burden of for firms of entering new markets, including things like uh, global sandbox initiatives and, and, and sort of mutual recognition of each other's sandboxes so that firms can um, can test products in multiple markets. So I think that is um, that is quite a potentially ex exciting development, which we, we very much hope, certainly on our side, that the um, FCA will succeed in, in promoting. Um, so I'm just going to come to uh, another question now, if I may, which is um, probably one for you, Guy. As fintechs increasingly focus on the millennial market and use new methods of promoting products, what are some of the specific issues to look out for? Sure. So um, I think we're certainly seeing fintechs pursue less traditional approaches to marketing, for example, promoting their products uh, through social media. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of firms fall foul because of that approach of the financial promotion rules and increased focus from the regulator on um, or on looking at how fintech firms are using social media. And I know the FCA last week said that they're taking enforcement action against a number of firms for financial promotion breaches. Uh, we saw Lanny Star get into hot water with the FCA uh, last year for kind of purporting or indicating through their media campaign uh, on social media that they were regulated where they were not, they were uh, relying on other people's licenses. So um, they kind of went head first into the marketing campaign without kind of having consideration on how it would be portrayed to retail consumers. Um, we're also seeing, um, you know, uh, we're also seeing focus on um, the use of technology maybe to circumvent certain restrictions, for example, cold calling. So some fintechs have got into trouble for using um, online messaging systems and have not apply, applied their controls, which they would apply to call staff or on those message, messaging programs. Um, and also a lot of fintechs do approve, regulated fintechs do approve financial promotions of third parties, for example, celebrity influencers. So this kind of comes into the debate going on about what controls do you put on firms approving financial promotions. So we expect uh, the FCA to introduce new rules and the Treasury to introduce new rules um, restricting the ability of um, firms to approve third party um, promotions. So I, it's all about making sure that those uh, financial promotions on social media uh, and other methods, you know, comply with the existing financial promotion rules. Thanks very much, Guy. So I think we've run out of time now. Um, thank you very much to everyone for listening. If we didn't get to your question and you'd like to get in touch with us, then please feel free to do so. Our contact details are all online. Um, and in the meantime, thank you very much for listening again. Thank you to Innovate Finance for hosting today's session. And we hope all of you enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much.